Welcome. My name is Chris Nyman, and today I'm going to be showing you uh, some one-step naked raku. In my last video, I did some raku ornaments uh, with uh, copper glazes, and uh, they came out great. Uh, this particular technique is not unlike uh, a regular sort of glazed raku fire, except for one big difference. We're not using glaze today. Uh, we are just using slip. Uh, we're not uh, applying any glaze that needs to mature or uh, become liquid. There's no glass involved. There's all smoke patterning. Uh, that's how you achieve the naked raccoon effect. Uh, some people asked me for some information about uh, my kiln. Um, and so first I'd like to share that with you. Uh, for a uh, shout out to Matt Lane. Uh, who's integral to this whole process. He and I work hand in hand on building the kiln and firing it and keeping things uh, together. So thank you, Matt. I appreciate your help. And of course, Matt is a wonderful ceramicist in his own right. So uh, please check him out if you can, or if you know him, give him a shout out. Uh, so here's our kiln. Um, you can see that it is on uh, a rolling cart. It makes it easy to bring it in and out, set up and break down it's very simple when you don't have to break down the kiln. Um, and uh, we have a propane tank and a regulator and a burner um, supplying the fire. Uh, those are purchased items. I like to stay professional when working with the business end of a fire. Uh, the kiln itself is uh, reclaimed. Uh, it's an electric kiln that was pulled out of a dumpster. A friend of ours said, hey, come on and try this out. So at the bottom, you can see we have some, some kiln rings, um, which is our sort of flame chamber. Uh, on top of that is a kiln shelf with holes punched in it. Uh, you can see here we have holes positioned so that the heat can come through. And a second kiln shelf on stands directing the heat to the outside. Uh, on top, we have a little top hat that we've created out of a steel trash can lined with fire blanket. Uh, and pinned in place with nichrome wire and handmade, <laughs> handmade uh, ceramic buttons. Uh, this is all sort of to keep the heat inside and uh, to stay safe. You'll also notice there's a peephole on the side of the can, which is huge. The very first time we were trying this, we tried with no peephole. It was a bunch of guesswork. You were guessing. Uh, the people let you look in and see the process, see where you are and know exactly when you should and shouldn't act. It's a wonderful little thing. Uh, as you prepare your pots, so you've thrown, you've thrown your vase, you've thrown your form. Um, one of the things that I like to do is while I'm on the wheel is I'll wet trim and wet burnish the piece uh, to, to get the surface as smooth as possible, at least the surface that I intend uh, to put slip on. And then when you've reached leather hard and you are trimming your piece, again, you might come back with another burnishing tool. Uh, I prefer this piece of jade uh, that I picked up in some health store kit. I'm not sure exactly what it was for, uh, but it's got nice little uh, divots and curves and so forth so that you can nicely sm and smoothly burnish your pieces. After you've burnished your leather hard piece, you let it dry to full bone dry. Uh, it comes the next step. And the next step is applying uh, terra sigillata to the outside of the piece. And what the terra sigillata will do is fill in a lot of the gaps, fill in a little crack, smooth out the surface and make a highly polishable surface. And as you can see here, we are taking, uh, we're taking plastic bags. You can use gloves, you can use a lip free cloth. We, plastic bags really actually end up being really nice. Uh, and you polish the terra sigillata to a high shine. After you have polished the terra sigillata, uh, you place it in a kiln and fire, we fire to code 05, 1880, somewhere there, somewhere thereabouts. And um, once it's out of the bisque, we are ready to prepare it for our one-step raccoon. 
Uh, the one step, again, this is just the Raku fire. Uh, obviously, we've been through a couple steps. But the one step is that you dip it in wet slip and put it directly into the kiln. Uh, this, this achieves a couple things, but the first, the, let's start with you need to tape off areas or, or, or be careful when you're dipping to not put, to not put slip on areas that you don't want it to go. Uh, to make sure that you leave ample room to grab the piece with your uh, with your tongs to remove it. Um, designs you can you know, tape designs you can you know, draw designs. However, however you want to decorate your piece, you need to create areas that will accept slip and areas that will resist them. Tape is a great option. Once you have prepared your piece with tape, then you dip it into the slip. And then once this, it comes out of the slip, you pull away your tape, you clean up any areas like the bottom that you don't want the slip to be on, and you put it in the kiln. So the kiln has been preheated to about 500 degrees, and we're going to keep it there. It likes to hold there once you've uh, warmed it up. Everything stays all nice and hot. And we're going to leave it in the kiln for about 15 minutes. And during that time, that wet slip will dry out and it will begin to shrink and crack. Those cracks, those random cracks, kind of looking like a dry riverbed. Uh, you can see a little picture here um, of what it would look like after those 15 minutes. That's your patterning. Those are, those, that's a great approximation of what you're going to get when the process is done. So once the slip is dried and cracked and is in the patterning you like, now it's time to actually fire. We fire our kiln uh, in steps. We like to feather our fire with five minutes on and one minute off. And you can reach your optimal temperature uh, for this particular process, about 1500 degrees, um, in 10 minutes. So we do five on, one off, five on. Uh, and then we use a visual process just to make sure there at the last couple minutes that we're at the temperature that we want to be at, at the spot that we want to be at. And then we open the kiln and you very carefully move your piece from the kiln to a combustion chamber. In the combustion chamber, you see we have newspaper as our combusted material. There's a piece of fire brick. Uh, at the bottom just sit the piece on so it stays nice and level and doesn't get jostled. And after it flames up, you cap it and you let it sit for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, most of that is to get it nice and cool, but the other part is that you want the smoke that is created to penetrate your piece and turn all the exposed areas black. Once that period is over, that 15, 20 minutes or so, 25, you can leave it in there for half an hour. Uh, depending on how long you leave it in the production chamber, uh, it will depend on how dark of a smoke you get. If you leave it in there a short period of time, you'll get a light gray. If you leave it in there a long period of time, you'll get a very stained, dark look. Um, it's a personal preference, and you would have to try, uh, try it yourself to find out what you like. Um, and once it comes out, you take a knife or you can use a gloved hand and very carefully brush away all of that slip that you put on at the very beginning of the process. And what that does is it reveals a gorgeous smoke pattern all over the piece, sort of like horsehair, uh, where you're introducing different combustibles to create smoke patterns. This is the exact same thing. Um, it's very satisfying to pull a pot out and, and have it reveal itself in this manner. Uh, it's, it's something that you would only really get to experience by doing it yourself and I highly recommend it. After the piece is allowed to completely cool, you then follow up with a light sanding or an abrasive material uh, to remove any little gunks or any bits of uh, detritus or bits of carbon that are left on the piece, making it nice and smooth. 
and then uh, I follow up with uh, a workable fixative. Uh, typically you use like pencil or pastel drawings. You would draw on a thing and you would spray this fixative on top of it to lock in what you've done so you don't smudge it and then you can work over top of it. This works really well uh, for the carbon lines, the smoke lines uh, that are created on a piece uh, to keep them from smudging as you're getting ready to work a wax over top of them. Uh, the first wax that I like to use uh, is a uh, micro crystalline wax. This is the Renaissance brand. But uh, this hard wax creates a nice hard wax surface on your piece. Uh, you polish that to a high shine and let it set up for about a day or two. And then finally, you come back with a liquid cream wax. Uh, this is gel gloss again. You can pick this up uh, pretty much anywhere. And the liquid wax is the last step. You apply it to the piece and buff it to a nice high shine. Um, and then you're done. Thank you for joining me today uh, for this demonstration of Naked Raku. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. And I will see you next time. And until then, happy potting. Have a great day, everyone.